Well, I thought as we began tonight and really closed our sessions and our time in the book of Ruth, I thought that we would start by actually looking at and really discussing a biblical interpretive principle, meaning that if you want to be a good Bible reader, and not just a good Bible reader, if you want to be someone that when you read the scriptures, you understand what the scriptures say, this is going to be very, very important for you to understand about the Bible. It may seem obvious to say, but the scriptures actually, the, the whole point of the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that they're designed to show us Christ. They're designed to point us to Christ. And there's this interpretive principle that you'll see all throughout scripture called prophetic patterns that really show us the different ways that Christ is seen, specifically in the Old Testament. The way that scripture is shaped, the way that it is designed, the way that God intended it through the authors was to create these prophetic patterns that show us these glimpses of Christ, that really show us who he is, to show us what he's designed to be for us as sinful man, that show us a lot of different things about the character and the nature of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. They're called prophetic patterns. Patterns. And I just want to talk about a few of those. If you think back in Genesis, Genesis chapter 22, if you grew up in church, you're probably familiar with this story, Genesis 22, where God tells Abraham to take his son, his only son whom he loves, up onto a mountain and to plunge a knife into his chest. You guys remember this story? God tells Abraham, after a long time of waiting for a son, he finally gets a son, and then God says, hey, I want you to take that son, your only son, the son that you love, and I want you to take him, and I want you to sacrifice him for me. That's the story that we see in Genesis chapter 22. And if you know anything about that story, you know when they get up on the mountain, Abraham builds the altar, there's the wood there, he lays his son Isaac on the altar, he raises the knife, and he's about to end his son's life in submission and obedience to God, when ultimately he is stopped and there is a substitute sacrifice, a ram with its thorns stuck in the thicket nearby that God says, this is a sacrifice that I want you to make that I have given to you in place of your son. If you didn't know that, that is a prophetic picture of what Christ is for us. That just like that ram was a substitute sacrifice for Isaac, Jesus is our substitute sacrifice. That he is the one that takes the punishment for us. And that's not the only one. If you think about the Exodus event, where Moses, God calls Moses to lead the Israelites. They're in slavery and bondage to the Egyptians. God calls Moses, he raises them up, and he says, I want you to take my people and I want you to deliver them, be a part of the process of delivering them and freeing them from this slavery. And you know it's very dramatic. There's the parting of the Red Sea. There's the wiping away and destruction of the Egyptian army. And God rescues the people of Israel, delivers them from the hand of the Egyptian, Egyptians. And that's a picture, that's a prophetic pattern that's meant to point our gaze towards Christ. You see what scripture says in the New Testament, what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, is that we are in bondage, that we are in slavery, enslaved to our sin. And just like Moses was raised up to deliver the Israelites from their slavery, Christ was given and sent to us to deliver us from our slavery, to rescue us from our sin. Think about the story of Noah in Genesis chapter 6, where Noah is told by God to create this big ark, to build this big boat because a rain is coming, a flood is coming. And everyone in society, they were looking at Noah, they were laughing at him, they were disbelieving in the message that Noah was preaching, that judgment was coming. And if you know that story, when the rain started coming, the door of the ark shut, and all of the people that were not inside of the ark, they were swept away in the flood. And that story, the rain that came, was a picture of the wrath of God that's coming upon those who are not in Christ Jesus. And Noah and his family, safe inside the ark, is a picture for us who are the children of God, who are safe inside Christ on the day when God's wrath comes. That's a picture that is meant to point us ultimately to Christ. One last one, you think about the story of David and Goliath. Oftentimes we use that story to think, ah, oh, who's the Goliath in our life? Who's the giant that we need to slay? 
That's not really the point of the story at all. The point of the story of David and Goliath is to show us that we need someone to conquer our enemy, sin and death for us. We need someone to come who is the most unlikely of individuals, a, a, a suffering servant, Isaiah calls. And we need someone to come and to conquer the, the, the sin and the death that we are enslaved to. That's all throughout Scripture. As you read specifically the Old Testament, those prophetic patterns are meant to give you these glimpses and these pictures, and there's what's often referred to these types of Christ. Moses is a type of Christ. Aaron is a type of Christ. Noah is a type of Christ. They're all meant to point us ultimately to Christ. Now, what does that have to do with the story of Ruth? Well, the story of Ruth, in much the same way, is meant to point us to Christ, to show us who he is and what he offers to those who place their faith and trust in him. Admittedly, this story, if, you, if you're not familiar with the book of Ruth, if you're not familiar even with this idea of prophetic patterns, this idea of scripture pointing us to Christ, this story seems very strange and it seems very random. But I'm here to tell you that the whole story of Ruth, the, the last three to four weeks that we've spent studying it, it's not been about even Ruth, it's not been about Boaz, it's not been about Naomi, it's not been about any of those people. It's ultimately been about Christ. That's what the story is meant to point us to, to show us who he is and what that means for you right now sitting in this room on September 13th, 2022. The story of Ruth could not be more significant and more relevant to your life. That's the whole point. That's the point of Ruth. And that's what I want to show you this evening in the book of Ruth. So you have your Bibles. I want you to open them up to the book of Ruth one final time in the final chapter, Ruth chapter four. And we're going to see this, this idea, this interpretive principle of these prophetic patterns ringing true, especially as this story ends in Ruth chapter four. So open your Bibles, Ruth chapter four, verses one through 15. I really want you to see the text in front of you. I want you to see what I see so that we can look at it together. Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Let me just read the first part of this story for you. It says, Now Boaz has gone up to the gate and sat down there. Now if you remember how we ended chapter 3, Naomi gives Ruth these very odd instructions to basically give a marriage proposal to Boaz, to say, will you marry me, Boaz? We talked about the concept of a kinsman redeemer that's, that's commanded in the Old Testament law, and we saw that Boaz says, I will do all that you have asked of me. He says, yes, I will redeem you. I'm a part of the family of Elimelech. That's the family that Ruth married into. He says, I am one of your redeemers, but there's one closer than I. That's how we left in the story. So he's going to say, there's a redeemer closer. He's closer in the family line than I am. It's his responsibility. It's his right to, to redeem you first. And so that's where we pick up in the story in chapter four. Now, Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. That's where the official business of the town was was made. That's kind of, you can think about it like a court of law. That's what's happening here. And behold, the Redeemer, the other person that Boaz had referenced in chapter 3, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down together. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, but it, but, but it, in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence, by it rather, in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people, if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So Boaz tells him, hey, there's this situation, Ruth, Naomi, they need someone to marry into the family so that they can raise up another son in the, in the clan of Elimelech. There's this property that needs to be purchased. Are you willing to do this? He says, yes, I will redeem it. Verse 5, then Boaz said, the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, he kind of changes his mind, I, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance, take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. Again, this may seem strange, 
It's a different culture, a different context, but in order for them to enter into this legally binding agreement, it was customary for one of the individuals to take off their sandal and to give it to the other. That was their way of saying, this is a legal transaction that's happening. It's like exchanging money or something like that, right? So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the land of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are my witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may, you, and may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz is given the right to redeem Ruth. He's given the opportunity to marry Ruth, to acquire this land, and that's what we pick up in verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Now listen, I know admittedly that this is a lot. There was a lot of verses that we just read, and it seems kind of strange. There's a lot of customs, there's a lot of cultural differences that we see that are different, obviously, from our time period today. But here's what I want you to focus on. Here's what's really important in all that just happened. The summary is this. Boaz came through on his promise to Ruth and Naomi that he would redeem Ruth. He said, all that you ask, I will do for you. He goes to the city and he begins to initiate that process. He begins to go through all of the legal process, making sure that it's done right, making sure that it's done in an honoring way. And what we see and what I really want you to understand is that Boaz is the one throughout this whole story, and especially in chapter 4, who's taking the initiative. He's the one that goes up to the gate. He's the one that calls over the nearer kinsmen. He summons 10 of the elders to session. He constructs the court proceedings. He ultimately becomes Ruth and Naomi's redeemer. He goes out of his way. He is initiating. And again, as we saw even in chapter 2 and chapter 3, he's continuing to be generous with Ruth. He's continuing to provide. He's continuing to be a man of his word. Now, what does this have to do with Christ? We said this story is a prophetic picture of what Christ is for us. Well, just like Boaz took the initiative for Ruth and made sure that all of the things were in place, that all of the requirements were fulfilled exactly to the letter, it was Christ that took the initiative for you. It was Christ that came down from heaven. It was Christ that fulfilled all of the righteous requirements of the law that you could not it was Christ that taught the message of reconciliation with God through repentance and faith. That's what he says in the opening pages of Matthew. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And while you were still a sinner, Paul says in Romans 5, Christ died for you. And through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead three days later, he became your ultimate redeemer. What Boaz does in initiating all of these steps and making sure all of this is fulfilled exactly to the letter, he becomes Ruth's redeemer. And what Christ does for us when he fulfills the requirements of the law, when he lives a perfect sinless life, when he dies on the cross for you, receives the punishment of your sin, when he raises from the dead three days later, when he conquers sin and death, he becomes your ultimate redeemer. So what do you do with that this evening? Well, that's point number one on your outline. The response of the book of Ruth as a whole is for you to trust in Christ as your ultimate redeemer. That's what you need. Trust in Christ as your ultimate redeemer. And I want to, the title of this sermon is called Reframing Hope. The reason why I titled it that is because I want to go back to the beginning of this story and retrace this prophetic pattern that we've been talking about of Christ being our ultimate redeemer. I want to go back to the beginning and show you the way that Christ does this, but it's in a way that you might not expect. It's in a way that if you are not reading closely, if you're not reading and trying to interpret prayerfully, it may not be 
as obvious. Because what we see in the book of Ruth is Christ taking those who are empty and making them full. That's exactly what we see in the book of Ruth. Becoming our ultimate redeemer, he takes those who are empty, those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, those who are burdened and heavy laden and making them full. And this is a prophetic pattern that we see all throughout the Old Testament. Even if you think about the, the Israelites, God taking the Israelites and making them empty to full. We already kind of talked about this, but Pharaoh, he enslaved and oppressed the Israelites. They were in bondage. They were enslaved. They were having to do this hard labor. The Israelites, as a response to this, they cry out to help from God. They say, Lord, we are empty. We have nothing. We can't free ourselves from this. So what does God do? God raises up Moses to save his people, and the Israelites are delivered from slavery. He takes them from being empty in their slavery, slavery and makes them full in their freedom. If you think about the pattern of God taking the Israelites just in general from empty to full. Remember verse 1 of chapter 1 of Ruth where it says, all this took place during the days of the judges. And I said, that was a terrible time in the history of Israel. Well, the reason that it was terrible, it was because Israelites continually did evil in the sight of the Lord. They, they continue to worship false idols. They continue to do what was wrong in the sight of the Lord. So what does God do? God hands them over to be conquered by their enemies. We see this pattern over and over and over again. And then what do the Israelites do as a response? They cry out to God for help. And God in his mercy and his grace, he raises up judges in the book of Judges to help deliver them. He takes them from their emptiness, from their brokenness, and he makes them full. Now let's look at that in the book of Ruth. If you got your Bibles, go back to chapter 1. Ruth 1, 21. Chapter 1, verse 21. I want to show you this. This is incredible. It says, this is Naomi talking. I went away full. This is right after she says, call me Mara. I am bitter. It says, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? We see this pattern of Naomi proclaiming to Ruth and to others around her, I am empty. Everything has been taken from me. I can't fix my solution. I am empty. Look at verse 22. It says, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem, don't miss this, at the beginning of barley harvest. Now, that might seem like just a random detail that the author includes in chapter 1. But let me tell you this. This was meant for us as readers to, to be a sign that hope is coming, that there is a filling that's going to take place. They come to Bethlehem empty. They literally don't have anything. They don't have money. They don't have a means to provide for themselves. They don't have food. They come empty. But the, the end of chapter 1 says all this happens at the beginning of barley harvest. This is promise. It's embedded within that those simple words that filling is going to happen. Food even, in a practical way, is going to be provide, provided. They're going to be filled. Look at chapter 2. Turn there, verse 2. It says, And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose house, or whose sight I shall find favor. Ruth when she appears and goes to Boaz's field, she has nothing. She is empty. She has no food. She has nothing. And yet what we see at the end of chapter 2, look down to 23. It says, so she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lives with her mother-in-law. The beginning of chapter 2, she's empty. She comes to the field empty-handed. But by the end of it, if you remember this, the generosity of Boaz, she gives her an abundance of food. Do you remember that? She, he says, take from my stash. Eat of my food that I prepared for you. Take whatever it is that you need. Servants, don't, don't rebuke her. Don't mess with her. Let her take whatever she needs. And she leaves that field completely full. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. It says, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you? This is a reminder of what happened in chapter 1. Ruth's husband died, Naomi's husband died, Naomi's two sons died. And this is a reminder of their emptiness that Naomi says that they are coming to Bethlehem with in chapter 1. She says, should I not seek rest for you? Again, drawing attention to the fact that they are empty, that they don't have what they need. 
Skip down to verse 17 in chapter 3. If you remember this, this is after the marriage proposal that Ruth does to Boaz. It says, these six measures in verse 17 of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. You see the way that the author continues to use wheat and barley to show us they are being filled. God is being generous. God is providing. Verse 18, she replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. And we're back. It hasn't been finalized. The emptiness hasn't been erased. They haven't been filled once and for all. And that brings us to chapter 4. Look there again with me. Ruth chapter 4, verse 5. It says, then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Another reminder of the emptiness of Ruth, the emptiness that they came to Bethlehem with. And again, skip down to verse 13. Here's how really it all climaxes in this story. It says, So Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife, she is redeemed. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. All throughout this story, God is showing us that he takes those who are empty and makes them full. Through the work and the person of Christ, he takes us who are broken and empty and have nothing to bring, and yet he makes us full. In Christ, every spiritual blessing is given to us. And what Jesus says, even in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, all who are empty, and I will give you rest. I will make you full. The message of the gospel and the message of Ruth is an invitation by Christ to bring our emptiness to him so that he can make us full. That is the story of Ruth, to bring our emptiness to the one who can take that and can make us full, to the one that can fix that problem, to the one that can ultimately redeem us. Regardless of our sin, regardless of what we have done or what we have not done, God takes those who are empty and makes them full in Christ Jesus. That is the message of the gospel. That is the message of the book of Ruth. And in addition to that, what we see in this story is that the gospel message demonstrates the faithfulness of God to keep his promises, to keep all of his promises, but particularly in a unique way in this story. Let's read the rest of it. Look at verse 16 in chapter 4. It says, Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Now again, this just for us seems like a random list of names that means nothing. But let me tell you this. This is meant for us as readers to, to point us to the fact that God is answering his promise, that he's fulfilling his promise that he made all the way back, and he's doing it ultimately through Christ, who would come from the line of David. And that's point number two for you this evening. Look to Christ as the ultimate example of God's faithfulness. Look to Christ as the ultimate example, the ultimate fulfillment of God's faithfulness. The faithfulness of God to take those who are empty and make them full in and through the ministry of Christ. And this started all the way back in the beginning. And this is why I talked about this interpretive principle of prophetic patterns. Because this is going to help you to have confidence in the, the unity of the message of the Bible. And it shows you that you can truly trust what the Bible says because there's this one cohesive message and it really climaxes in the person of Christ and it starts all the way back in the beginning. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It was, this was right after Adam and Eve, they sinned. They did exactly what God told them not to do. And here's what God says, chapter 3, verse 15. It says, I will put enmity... I will put this separation and this tension and this division between you and the woman, 
and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And again, that seems like a strange verse, but what, is, what God is saying is that he is going to send someone that is going to right the wrong that happened all the way back in the beginning. He's going to send a seed of the woman, someone that would be raised up to take those who are empty and make them full. And he does that in and through Jesus Christ. That's why the author ends with this genealogy. It ends with King David because that's to point us forward to say the Messiah is coming. The one that was promised all the way back in the third chapter of the Bible that would right all of the wrongs, that would once and for all fix the problem of sin, that will have victory over sin. He is coming. That's what Ruth is pointing us to. Even in the opening verses of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, this is a, another genealogy, one of the, just a long list of names that might seem strange to us, but I want to read it for you. Matthew 1, 1 through 6. It says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the Messiah, the long-awaited promised one all the way from the beginning. That's what this is about. Verse 2 says, Abraham was the father of Isaac. And Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah, the father of Perez, does that sound familiar? And Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. This is the fulfillment of the promise made all the way back in the beginning. The promised Messiah that would right the wrongs, that would make those who are empty full. And even in verse 18 of the Gospel of Matthew, it says, She will bear a son, talking about Mary, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He will make those who are spiritually empty full. He will rescue you from the bondage of sin. He will make you full. He will establish a relationship with God. He will reconcile you to a holy God. And this was long promised to go, thousands of years ago, in the third chapter of the Bible. It says there is a seed, there is a Messiah that is coming, and that's what Ruth points us to. Ruth and Boaz, they have a son. His name is Obed, and he's the great grandfather of King David. And King David is the line in which the Messiah, Jesus Christ, came from. This is the cohesiveness of Scripture. That is the prophetic pattern that this book is meant to point us to. In the New Testament, it opens with a genealogy, a long list of names that to us might not mean anything, but that genealogy is meant to be a flashing neon said sign that says God has fulfilled his promise. God has done exactly what he said he was going to do, regardless of the faithlessness of Israel, regardless of the idolatry, regardless of how often they turn their backs against God. God has done exactly what he said he would do all the way from the beginning. That is the opening verses of the, the gospel of Matthew. God has fulfilled his promise. I want to show you this again in the book of Ruth. You might, again, have missed this. It's actually a, a pretty small detail, but it's significant. There's 85 verses in the book of Ruth. The first verse in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, again, it starts by saying, when the judges ruled, pointing us to our emptiness, pointing them to the reality that they were living in in this time where Israelite was empty because of their own sinfulness. That's how the book of Ruth opens, when the judges ruled. The very last verse of the book of Ruth, Ruth 4, 22. Jesse fathered David. This promise, this, this significant sign that's meant to point us to the fulfillment of the promise made all the way back in the beginning of the book of Genesis. Jesse fathered David. Hope is coming. Hope is coming in the Messiah. Hope, though it might feel hidden to us, that's the name of our series, hidden to us, what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, that the mystery hidden for ages has now been revealed through the person of Jesus Christ. So it starts with emptiness when the judges rule. It ends with this promise of hope and this picture that God is faithful to his promises. Jesse, fa Father David, in the very center of the book, don't miss this, 
the very center of the book, you can fact check me on this, Ruth chapter 2, verse 20. Do you know what it says? It talks about Boaz being the kinsman redeemer. The whole point of this book is for us to understand that Christ is our redeemer. He is the long-awaited Messiah that was promised from the beginning. He is the one that can take our brokenness and make us full. He can take our weariness and give us rest. That is the message of the gospel. That is the message of the book of Ruth. And listen, all the different things that we've talked about, and we've looked at the character of Ruth, we've looked at the, the godliness of Boaz, we've looked at all of those different things. Those are great lessons for us. We can learn to even walk in obedience. We can learn to trust God. That is great. But the point of Ruth is to point us to the person of Jesus Christ, the person that can ultimately forgive you of your sin, to take you from being empty and make you full. That is the message of Ruth. That's what the author wants you to know. And if you're here this evening and you would even sympathize or understand what it means to feel empty, to feel broken, to feel lost or trapped or confused by the brokenness of this world, to look around at the world around you and to, to think to yourself, as Ecclesiastes says, there's got to be something more. There has to be hope. The hope for you is provided and offered in and through the person of Christ. And what the Bible tells us is that for us to have this hope, this hope that feels oftentimes hidden to us, though it has revealed in Christ, for us to have that hope is to turn from our sin, to acknowledge that we have sinned in the face of a holy God and to place our trust in Christ as our ultimate redeemer. And to see Christ as the ultimate example of his faithfulness, that he will fulfill his promises, that he is a good God that does exactly what he says in his perfect timing in the exact way that we need. That is the message of the gospel. That is the extension of hope that you are offered here this evening. That if you would respond in repentance and place your faith and trust in Christ, that he truly is the promised Messiah, that he is the one that can take you from being empty and make you full, you can experience eternal life with God in Christ. That's why we studied this book. That's why we study scripture. That's why we do what we do. That's why we have small groups. It's so that you can know what 1 John 5.13 says. I want you to know what it means to have a relationship with Christ. And that comes from understanding that Christ is the one. He is the Messiah that can fix your wrong, your sin, that can provide a way for you to have a perfect relationship with God. To have a relationship with a perfect God. And he did that for us to make us Fool. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of the book of Ruth. Let me pray for us. Father, we're grateful. We're grateful for your word. Father, you are so faithful. You're faithful to your promises. You're faithful to us. You are beyond generous with us in Christ Jesus. Father, we're just like Ruth where we come to you with nothing in our hands. And yet if we place our trust in you, we leave with everything. And so, Father, I pray for the students in this room that are currently blind, that are currently dead in their trespasses and sins. Father, would you open their eyes? Would you allow them to see the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would you allow them to see that Christ is the promised Messiah, that he is the one who gives hope, that that hope that was hidden in, in the, the mystery of your plan and your will has now been revealed. And if we respond in repentance and faith and trust in your son, we can experience everlasting life. We can be born again. We can be made a new creation. So Father, I pray for the students now that don't know you. Father, would you open their eyes? Would you show them the truthfulness of who you are? And Father, even use now in small groups to sharpen them. Father, I pray these things in your son's name. Amen.